Good afternoon. Uh, before I forget, the reception after this talk is going to be in, in the library, so you can go through these doors, and it's right there. So there's a, you better stay till the end, because there's cookies, I think. Um, good afternoon, and welcome to today's Wednesday afternoon, afternoon lecture series on uh, Tuesday. On behalf of the Washington Area Yeast Interest Group, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Susan Wente from the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology at Vanderbilt uh, School of Medicine. Susan received her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from University of Iowa, and then did her PhD at UC Berkeley with some of the people sitting here in the audience, apparently. After a short but productive postdoc with Aura Rosen at uh, Sloan Kettering, Susan joined the Blobel Lab at Rockefeller University to work on what became the focus of her research ever since, namely the nuclear pore complex and nuclear cytoplasmic trafficking. In 1993, Susan became a faculty member at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, where she continued to publish seminal papers on the structure of nuclear pores and the regulation of nuclear export. In 2002, Susan was appointed chair of the Cell and Developmental Biology Department at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. And since 2009, she's been an associate vice chancellor for research and Senior Associate Dean for Biomedical Sciences at Vanderbilt. She has held numerous positions at the American Society of Cell Biology. She's been a member of various study sections, advisory boards, editorial boards, just to name a few. Susan has won many awards throughout her career. Most recently, her, the John Exton Award for Research Leading to Innovative Biological Concept. There is no doubt that Susan's research has an incredible impact on our understanding of nuclear cytoplasmic trafficking. And perhaps what is most impressive is that she continues to publish creative and highly influential studies while spending many hours in service of scientific community and raising two children. With this, I would like to invite Susan to the podium. The title of her talk is Beyond Nuclear Pores from MRNA Export to Translation. Thank you very much, Orna, and thank you to all of you being here today on my rescheduled visit where there's no snow and maybe just a threat of a thunder shower, but we can survive that. And so it's really um, my great privilege to be here today to talk to you about the work that we're doing in my laboratory. And as Orna explained, my laboratory is focused on nucleocytoplasmic transport, and this is a fundamental aspect of all cell biology. And I think to start off my talk, because I was invited here as part of the yeast consortium group, and because of, I'd say, you know, my, my newfound expanding administrative roles, one theme that I hope you take home from my talk is that you can work with a model system, a budding yeast, and make fundamental impacts or insights into human health. And the strategy that my laboratory has taken as its overall um, framework over the last 18 or more years is that by studying how normal cells work and determining what parts in those cells are important, that we can eventually have insights into what is broken or how what is broken can be fixed in a disease cell. And I will also argue throughout this talk at different points that doing both of these types of studies in parallel is essential and that they are interdependent. Now in terms of um, nucleocytoplasmic transport, this is a human tissue culture cell grown in culture. And the a common component of eukaryotic cells is that the genomic material is encased in a compartment or a room in the cell termed the nucleus. And that the nucleus is really could be considered the control center of the cell. And that if you can control the nucleus, you could in essence control all cellular function. Now this aspect of encasing the DNA within this nuclear compartment separates it from the site of protein synthesis in the cytoplasm. And so therefore, to be able to control different aspects of cellular physiology, macromolecules have to be exchanged back and forth between these two compartments. And so moving in and out of the nucleus has been a, a fundamental area of, of research for many different laboratories. And you could consider the, the actual mechanism requires special doors in the nuclear envelope, which we refer to as nuclear pore complexes. Two fundamental aspects of this nucleocytoplasmic transport mechanism include, one, that small macromolecules can passively diffuse 
through these doors back and forth thus making this inherently distinct from the translocation mechanisms across other subcellular organelles, for example, distinct from translocation across the ER membrane, endoplasmic reticulum, across the peroxisomal membranes, and across the mitochondrial membranes. But in similar mechanistic um, to those other membrane translocation mechanisms, larger macromolecules require a facilitated um, signal-dependent mechanism. Now, in terms of the amount of translocation and the types of factors that are translocated between the nucleus and the cytoplasm, as I referred to, the genomic material is encased within the nucleus, and based upon the action of polymerases, the resulting messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA in the form of assembled ribosomal subunits, and shuttling proteins are exported out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And in contrast, all of the proteins which are translated in the cytoplasm, transcription factors, histones, any of your favorite um, splicing factors, have to be imported into the nucleus in order to execute their functions. There's estimates based upon the amount of transport that ha needs to happen to maintain normal cellular physiology that there's one to two million molecules exchanged per second um, within a normal eukaryotic cell. So in terms of the signal-dependent mechanisms that are used to translocate, this relies upon transport receptors and energy to move through those nuclear pore complexes. So for example, if this is a protein which is destined for the nucleus, on its surface there's an amino acid sequence which is, in essence, could be considered a key which gets recognized by that transport receptor for um, transport into the nucleus. And in the paradigm that follows the translocation mechanism across the endoplasmic reticulum, and in terms of how these keys are recognized, um, Gunter Blobel's often referred to them as being recognized by a mailman that can, or a male person, that can direct them to their proper cellular destination. And in this case, that would be import into the nucleus. Now, the doors that are the sole sites for nucleocytoplasmic transport have been studied for many years, and um, in particular with the invention and the development of electron microscopy, really gorgeous views of them have come to be. And so this is an example of um, a thin section electron micrograph where you can see the outer nuclear envelope fused to the inner nuclear envelope. And in this pore or passageway, there's proteinaceous electron-dense material, which are actually those nuclear pore complexes that are mediating and providing the conduit for messenger RNAs to move out and proteins to move in. Now, these electron-dense assemblies are very large macromolecular complexes, which are now known to be made up of at least 30 distinct polypeptides. So why have separated trans, uh, translation and the production of proteins in the cytoplasm from the production of the messenger RNAs in the cytoplasm? And one argument that can be made for this is that this allows a eukaryotic cell additional levels of regulation in terms of transmitting signals between these compartments. It also allows regulation at multiple different levels in terms of the components. So the cargo that is being transported, either imported or exported through the nuclear pore complex itself can be regulated such that it only enters or exits the nucleus at specific times or in response to specific signals. But it's also true that the receptors can also be controlled, either by um, a differential expression or by potentially sequestering them in different ways. And finally, there are increasing examples of how the nuclear pore complex itself could be controlled to allow regulated transport at different phases, either during um, stem cell differentiation or during aging. Linking this further to the fact that transport, is, and transport regulation um, is a normal cellular physiological process that could be potentially impacted in different disease mechanisms. It is well documented by a number of different laboratories that potentially during cancer cell growth, the nucleocytoplasmic dynamics of different proteins could be altered. And this shows an example of the localization of the tumor suppressor P53 in the nucleus in a normal cell. However, in a cancer cell, its localization is altered. <laughs> 
Likewise, there have been increasing reports, especially with the sequencing of the human genome, of developmental disorders that have been linked genetically to genes encoding factors that are part of the nuclear pore complexes or that are part of the transport machinery. Um, in particular, the AAA syndrome has been linked to mutations in a gene encoding a nuclear pore complex protein. Um, another example um, is of Swire syndrome, wherein a transcription factor has specific mutations in its nuclear localization sequence, which impacts its being imported into the nucleus. And finally, the other very classic example to kind of set the framework for you uh, in terms of the importance of understanding nucleocytoplasmic transport is how viruses can really pirate these different transport pathways in order to enable their replication and proliferation within the cell. So in terms of my laboratory's approach to studying this fundamental cell biological pathway, we've really taken and focused on at least three different questions over the years. One of those questions involves what is the mechanism of nuclear pore complex assembly? And so this shows you again this fusion of the inner and the outer membrane and the assembly of a cartoonized version of how these 30 different proteins assemble into that pore. And I think I was uh, last gave a talk at NIH when I was on study section during one trip and actually spent um, that seminar talking about the mechanism of nuclear pore complex assembly. I'm not going to talk about that today. Another key question is how does cargo translocate through the nuclear pore complex? So the transport receptors that are bound to cargo dock, for example, at the nuclear face and mediate translocation to the cytoplasmic face to release cargo. And what is that translocation mechanism through this nuclear pore complex? And today I'm going to talk about specifically a few key steps during that translocation mechanism for the, mes for the export of messenger RNA. And then a third question is what are the potential connections between nuclear transport and the regulation of gene expression? And then overall, how do these potentially impact on disease and development? So the approaches that we've used to um, answering these questions have been multifaceted. And as I've already referred to, um, one of our favorite model systems for, if you want to say, discovering the doors, the keys, and the delivery mechanisms has been using the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this shows you a GFP tagged nuclear pore complex protein expressed in budding yeast where you see this very distinct peripheral nuclear localization. But we've also extended our studies to tissue culture human cell systems and more recently extended them to using the zebrafish model system. And I'm going to show you illustrations of really the um, conservation of the mechanisms and the processes that we've discovered in all of these systems during my talk today. So as I've casually referred to, I'm going to focus on talking about transport regulation of the mRNA life cycle. And that was also reflected in the title of my talk in terms of from mRNA export to translation. So in terms of this um, entire life cycle of a messenger RNA, there have been many reports from different laboratories about how different steps along this pathway are functionally coupled to one another, such that during transcription there's processing and um, assembly of a protein RNA structure such that um, at the end of transcription and processing there is a messenger RNP that's properly polyadenylated and capped and has a protein um, cohort on it that is recognized by transport receptors for targeting to the nuclear pore complex and translocation. What's also um, been documented in, in several elegant studies is that some of the proteins that are recruited during this nu these nuclear events actually direct the fate of that mRNP once it reaches the cytoplasm. So in other words, whether or not it is directed for trafficking to subcellular destinations, whether it's directed for turnover and degradation, or whether it's directed for tra immediate translation. And so the messenger RNA um, binding proteins play critical roles in mediating and regulating steps along this entire pathway. In terms of the questions that I'm going to address in my talk today, I'm going to spend um, the first half of the lecture talking to you about recent insights and kind of our overall mechanism for how macromolecules are, uh, and in particular messenger RNAs, are directionally transported through the nuclear pore complex.
What are the factors that regulate the exit of MRNPs through this nuclear pore complex? And then secondly, I'm going to talk to you about how potentially these events that are happening at the nuclear pore complex impact the cytoplasmic fates of those messenger RNPs. Now, um, every scientific story owes its underpinnings to many years of work of the people in the laboratory. And actually, the set of work that I'm going to talk to you about today really spans the entire length of time um, that I've been doing research um, since I left the Global Laboratory. And in particular, the story that I will start out with and, and begin with was with one of my first graduate students, Rob Murphy. Um, Rob is not dead. This does not reflect a terminal date or his only lifespan. This was the time frame in which he spent in my laboratory. And um, you can see he really loved yeast. So he's got plates stacked all the way up. And the fire marshals at Vanderbilt and Wash U wouldn't have let us have those up there. So I'm, I'm sure we never did. But um, he really um, took some key steps from starting from a set of nuclear pore complex genes and launching us off into studying a set of essential mRNA export factors from yeast genetics. The, um, the next set of people who've made major contributions are a former graduate student, Abel Arcazar Roman, who's now a postdoc at Yale, and Beth Tran, a postdoc who's now an assistant professor at Purdue University. And then I'll go on to tell you um, how these studies all connect to the current work of three people in my laboratory, a postdoc, Tim Bolger, and two graduate students, Andrew Folkman and Kristen Noble. And so in terms of Rob Murphy's initial work in my laboratory, Rob used yeast genetics starting with a mutant in a nuclear pore complex gene to identify an essential mRNA export factor. And so this essential mRNA export factor we gave a very poor name to, GLE-1. GLE-1 means nothing other than a genetic, um, it means GLFG synthetic lethal, and during the reception you can ask me what that actually means. And he identified this essential gene in yeast, and it localizes around the nuclear rim at the nuclear pore complex, and using that we were able to identify a human orthologue of that yeast gene where in the C terminal regions are fairly highly conserved um, given the evolutionary time span. And it is also localized around the nuclear rim, although there are two alternatively spliced versions, one of which is more predominant in the cytoplasm, the other more predominant around the nuclear rim, and both of which shuttle back and forth between the nucleus and the cytoplasm, both of which also have a specific docking site on the cytoplasmic face of the nuclear pore complex. So these are essential mRNA export factors. We can document that with yeast mutants. We can also document that in um, human tissue culture cells using miRNA. And so, for example, um, this is the Western blots documenting that we have um, knockdown of human GLE-1, and we can get add back by um, a resistant, um, expressing resistant clones of the alternatively spliced versions. And then we can assay by in situ hybridization for polyadenylated RNA. This shows the two transfected cells in this panel versus a non transfected cell here. And this is the localization of the polyadenylated RNA. In the non transfected cell where GLE1 levels are normal, you can see that the polyadenylated RNA is both in the cytoplasm and the nucleus representing normal export versus in these two cells, which are transfected with the miRNA, and where we have um, knockdown of the, um, of the endogenous GLE1A isoforms, you see accumulation of polyadenylated RNA in the nucleus, and the cytoplasmic levels drop. So this implicated GLE1 as being an essential mRNA export factor in both yeast and in human cells. But aside from the fact that it localized and bound to a specific nuclear pore complex protein on the cytoplasmic filaments, we did not know what function it executed in mRNA export. And so to try to reveal that, Rob did a second generation synthetic lethal genetic screen. And um, this was uh, much, to the, uh, much against the advice of his thesis committee, who had suggested that he actually do biochemistry, which would have been appreciated too, but actually the genetics told us what biochemistry we needed to do in the long run. And so this genetic screen with this GLE-1 mutant um, actually identified all of the enzymes that are required for the production of inositol hexakis phosphate in yeast cells. 
So inositol hexacus phosphate, or IP6 for short, is a soluble inositol polyphosphate wherein the inositol ring is phosphorylated on all six positions. And this is a product of the phospholipase C pathway, wherein phospholipase C cleaves PIP2 to release IP3. And we identified in this genetic screen the kinase, a dual function kinase, IPK2, that phosphorylates IP3 to IP4 and IP4 to IP5. And then this kinase, which I'll refer to as IPK1, that phosphorylates IP5 to IP6. And so actually, you know, this genetic screen, although it seems very straightforward on this screen, was really quite surprising, and it was, um, took several years to sort out. When we actually, when Rob actually did the first cloning and identified one of the mutant alleles as PLC1, this mutant allele, when he cloned it, was not homologous to anything in the database and was an ORF without function. And we let it sit in the freezer for a couple years until we were connected with John York at Duke University, who, um, through collaborators, let us know um, that he was very interested in these downstream products of PLC1, but he didn't know what the enzymes were that were generating them. And so we had an incredibly productive collaboration in terms of my laboratory generating mutants in this pathway and his laboratory being able to help us dissect that the genes we had actually identified were the enzymes required for the production of IP6. And this shows you that cells that lack IP6 accumulate polyadenylated RNA in the nucleus. Therefore, this is required for messenger RNA export. Now, just as a sidelight in terms of this pathway, that was the first identification of enzymes that could produce these soluble inositols in cells. And since then, many laboratories have gone on to identify additional enzymes in many other organisms that produce these soluble inositides as well as inositol pyrophosphates, so wherein there are two phosphates um, in, on one position. Um, and more so have gone on to identify cellular functions, and some of this work has actually been conducted right here at NIH and Carl Wu's laboratory in terms of chromatin remodeling, cellular functions that require the production of these inositol polyphosphates. So in terms of my own laboratory's work, I've told you that we identified an essential mRNA export factor, GLE1 and that we identified that GLE1's function requires the production of, of inositol hexacus phosphate, or IP6. Well, why is that? And so working from reports of other factors that have been identified to bind IP6, in particular um, ADAR, which is an RNA editing enzyme, which Brenda Bass's lab identified as an IP6 binding protein, we focused in on IP6 potentially binding directly to GLE1, and we compared the sequence of GLE1 from multiple different organisms, and based upon the comparison of the residues that were required to bind IP6 and ADAR, we were able to identify potential conserved residues. And indeed, when those conserved residues are altered compared to wild-type protein, we could definitively conclude that IP6 binds directly to GLE1. So um, this is a equilibrium binding assay, and we could find that GLE1 on wild type GLE1 binds IP6 with a KD of approximately 95 nanomolar, and making mutants um, in two of these residues severely inhibits the binding to IP6. And indeed, these mutants that lack IP6 binding phenocopy the mutants that lack IP6 production. Again, saying that GLE1 is the target for IP6 um, in mRNA export. So now we have two factors which come together, bind to each other, and execute a critical step in mRNA export. But what step in mRNA export? And so this led us again to another set of genetic studies, which I won't go through, but it led us to um, um, implicating them potentially in regulating a particular dead box protein that's required in mRNA export. So what are dead box proteins? And at this point, you're all going, gosh, she's saying a lot of different factors. But the only thing you have to remember are GLE1, IP6, and dead box proteins for the rest of my talk. So in terms of dead box proteins, this is a very large family of conserved enzymes, which um, each of these colored circles in here represent um, the, uh, the functional link for a different family member. There are approximately 25 in yeast and greater than 38 in human cells. Some of them have had effectors identified, 
They each are predicted to have RNA-dependent ATPase activity, and they are thought to act in cells in these different steps of either um, transcription, splicing, ribosome assembly, um, translation, turnover and degradation of RNA as either RNA helicases or as RNP remodeling enzymes, so that they would either unwind RNA duplexes or remember in terms of my slide where I talked about RNA binding proteins um, having an impact on the fate of the messenger RNAs, they could um, effectively modulate which RNA binding proteins are bound to an RNA at different steps. And that's what we refer to as MRNP remodeling. And so what we were able to um, determine by focusing on this particular dead box protein right here, DBP5 at the nuclear pore complex, were the functions for GLE1 and IP6 and mRNA export. So this particular dead box protein, DBP5, had been identified in multiple laboratories as having an essential role in mRNA export, in particular the Cole, Tartikoff, Chang, and Isaralde laboratories, and that's in both human and in yeast cells. And so what um, we showed, and I'm going to show you a couple pieces of data to support this, is that GLE1 docks at the nuclear pore complex in a site juxtapositioned to a docking site for this dead box protein, and that this juxtapositioning allows activation of this dead box protein to mediate remodeling of the transport receptor on the mRNP and other shuttling HNRNP proteins that are bound to the mRNA. So in terms of the effect on the dead box protein, um, this we were really able to document by Beth Tran and Abel Alcazar Roman's hard work at one being able to purify both GLE1 and DBP5. And whenever I give this talk and I show this gel, it looks like very, it was very straightforward. However, this was, you know, um, this had been a goal since Rob Murphy's day to be able to purify GLE1. And Beth, um, Beth was really tenacious and she did not give up and was able to identify conditions to purify it. IP6, meanwhile, well, Abel could say he got the easier job. Actually, he purified DBP5, but he bought IP6 from Sigma. This is actually um, IP6, which you can buy in a vitamin store, and he got this off the internet to put it on here. But that's the least of our, um, least of our problems when we are reconstituting this system in vitro. What we were able to show is that DBP5's ATPase activity, its hydrolysis of ATP to ADP, by itself has this level. But when we add both GLE1 and IP6, this is significantly stimulated. And in particular, when we look at the amount of RNA that's needed to stimulate that ATPase activity, this curve here, not even to saturation, is the amount of RNA on a log scale that's needed when DBP5 is by itself. But when you add GLE1 and IP6, it shifts approximately 20-fold lower. So you need much less RNA to stimulate the ATPase activity in the presence of GLE1 and IP6. And what we've been able to show most recently um, through Kristen Noble's laboratory is that GLE1 also directly um, stimulates ATP loading onto DBP5. Um, similar work um, in terms of these initial conclusions was also reported by Karsten Weiss's laboratory. Now what Kristen has been able to go on to do, which we find very exciting, is that GLE1 stimulates the ATP loading and the ATPase activity of DBP5 and then DBP5 is bound to ADP. And what she um, has found is that actually the NUP that DBP5 binds to at the pore complex is required for release of that ADP. So this is an equilibrium binding for 24 hours with radioactive ADP and uh, for 10 minutes or for, 20, uh, for 24 hours um, afterwards, it stays very stably bound. If she adds GLE1 to this, nothing happens, the ADP stays bound. If she adds RNA, nothing happens, it stays bound. But if she adds recombinant purified NUP159 binding site, so this is the NUP DBP5 binds to here, the ADP is released. And if she uses mutants in NUP159 that block this interaction, they do not release the ADP from DBP5. So in essence, if you think of this as a cycle, DPP5 is an ATPase. 
and it's cycling between the ATP and the ADP bound states. And both of these effectors, which are docked on the cytoplasmic face of the nuclear pore complex, are facilitating this enzymatic cycle. Wherein GLE1 is facilitating ATP loading and ATP hydrolysis, and NUP159 is facilitating ADP release. And so you could think of this potentially that these dead box proteins are being regulated very, in a very similar manner to which G proteins are regulated wherein G proteins are regulated by guanine nucleotide exchange factors, and I'm referring here to an ADP release factor, and they're also stimulated by, are regulated by um, uh, GAPs or GTPase activating factors, and I'm referring here to GLE1 IP6 as an ATPase activating factor. And so thinking of this as a cycle which is happening at the nuclear pore complex on the cytoplasmic face, we have GLE1 again stimulating ATP loading and the ATPase activity, and NUP159 stimulating ADP release and coming off when the ATP is bound. Now, also akin to G proteins, which undergo a nucleotide dependent conformational change, um, crystallographic studies of the um, ADP bound form of human DBP5 by um, a, consortia, a European consortium and of the human DBP5 bound to RNA and ATP by Elena Conti's laboratory actually shows, again, this ATP to ADP conformational change. And what's also interesting in these structures is that the RNA binding site here in the ATP bound form compared to where it would have been in, um, in the same side on the ADP bound form also significantly changes suggesting that the RNA which is bound can be conformationally changed to allow the remodeling of any bound proteins. So in terms of how are macromolecules transported through the nuclear pore complex, we have found that there is a set of essential factors on the cytoplasmic fibrils of the nuclear pore complex that are required to execute a specific enzymatic step on the MRMP that is being translocated through. And we speculate that this localized activation of this dead box protein on the cytoplasmic face of the nuclear pore complex provides directional control over the export of that mRNP, such that it does not come out into the cytoplasm and get re-imported back into the nucleus. And so that this is a critical step in terms of removing those transport factors and removing mRNP our mRNA binding proteins which might have inhibitory or detrimental functions within the cytoplasm. So now, from the study of these factors, are there any potential links to connections between export and the cytoplasmic face of, fate of the mRNP? Are any of the actions which are happening here impacting translation or turnover or localization? And in particular, Tim Bolger in the laboratory asked a question in terms of whether or not is there a link between, um, is GLE1 a link between mRNA export and translation? So I'd already um, described to you how human GLE1 has multiple subcellular localizations in terms of the fact that there are two isoforms, one in predominantly cytoplasmic, one predominantly pore, that shuttle between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. We'd also previously found in a two-hybrid screen that human GLE1 can interact with a subunit of the eukaryotic initi initiation factor 3. And then at around this same time, Heike Kraber's laboratory in Germany reported that mutant alleles of DBP5, the dead box protein that I just told you about that GLE1 activates at the nuclear pore complex during mRNA export, has a potential role in translation termination. And so we speculated that based upon these three pieces of evidence that GLE1 might also have a role in translation regulation in addition to and separate from its role in mRNA export. And indeed, um, Tim was able to use um, a number of different approaches, both genetic and biochemical, to document that GLE1 IP6 do indeed play a role in translation termination. Um, potentially, we speculate, by activating DBP5 in the same manner that it activates DBP5 during mRNA export. So in essence, if this is allowing spatial control over remodeling of an mRNP here, 
The spatial control over remodeling of the MRMP at this fate would be dictated by recruiting these factors specifically to this translation termination step. And this is potentially via interactions with ERF1 and potentially allows remodeling of this termination complex such that um, ERF3 or SUP35 can be recruited into that complex and allow um, termination to happen faithfully. But we still have significant amount of work to do on this particular mechanism to really resolve that it involves an MRNP remodeling step in the same way that this involves MRNP remodeling. But what Tim also found out in this work is that the mutants in GLE-1 that he assayed for translation effects not only had translation termination defects, but they also had defects in translation initiation. And this was potentially linked to this interaction with EIF3. Now, intriguingly, the production of IP6 did, and, and cells that lacked production of IP6 did not have a defect in the translation initiation assays. And the mutant alleles in DBP5 also did not have a defect in translation initiation. So we speculated that potentially there was a different dead box protein that was required or that GLE-1 could be affecting during translation initiation. And going back to this blow up of this part of the dead box family picture, there are indeed multiple different um, dead box proteins that, could potentially, that are potentially playing roles in translation um, at different steps. And so in some preliminary studies, um, we think that we have found a connection to GLE-1 regulating a different um, dead box protein, one called DEAD-1, um, which others have extensively characterized, and in particular, Alan Hinnebush's lab is um, continuing to work on the role of DEAD-1 in translation here, is an essential dead box protein, and it potentially plays a role in functioning in start site scanning by unwinding the secondary structure in the 5' prime UTR. Now, what Tim was able to find by using a genetic approach to start with is that a double mutant between GLE-1 and DEAD-1 showed a specific genetic interaction. So this particular DEAD-1 mutant is a cold-sensitive mutant wherein it's dead at 25 degrees and alive at all other temperatures, versus this GLE-1 mutant is dead at 37 and very, very sick at 30 and alive at the other temperatures. But this double mutant showed specific suppression of this GLE-1 temperature sensitive defect at 30 degrees. And in one set of follow-up experiments, we potentially think that GLE-1 plays a role in inhibiting the ATPase activity of DEAD-1. So this shows you the effect of GLE-1 on DBP5's ATPase activity that I already described to you, that it activates it. But for DEAD1, with purified recombinant DEAD1 and purified recombinant GLE1, we do not see activation, but rather see inhibition of DEAD1's ATPase activity. And IP6 has no effect on this inhibition, which correlates with the in vivo results that IP6 has no effect on, the lack of IP6 has no effect on our in vivo translation initiation assays. So taking all of these um, steps together, we'd speculate that GLE-1 targets multiple dead box proteins to modulate gene expression, both during mRNA export, translation initiation, and translation termination, and that it does this potentially differentially, activating one dead box protein and, in contrast, inhibiting a, another one. But this is... Um, um, early days in terms of our analyzing this particular mechanism, and um, we hope to be able to unravel that further in the same way that we've unraveled how GLE-1 affects DBP5's function. So what I've described to you so far is really our studying the role of one particular factor in nuclear transport, how it works in a normal cell, and what it is interacting with in terms of uh, interaction partners. Going back to my initial premise in terms of the fact that this might have an impact in terms of studying disease mechanism, um, if you were to have asked me what disease would I think GLE-1 would impact, I probably would never have guessed the one that a set of Finnish um, and English workers genetically linked it to, and that is a disease called LCCS1. And so what I'm going to describe to you for the last part of my talk is how we're really using our insights from studying GLE-1 in yeast and human cells to try to unravel 
how it is having an effect in this lethal motor neuron disease. And so um, LCCS1 is the acronym for Lethal Congenital Contracture Syndrome, and it is an autosomal recessive disorder. 1% uh, of the Finnish population is a carrier, and the pathology indicates a very severe atrophy of the anterior horn motor neurons and has been largely implicated as potentially being a, a motor um, de a degeneration of the motor neurons as the primary cause. Very interestingly, and this you can use to think about as you reflect on this later, there are two other reported LCCS1 um, diseases, other uh, forms of um, it, 2 and 3, and both of these have been genetically linked to enzymes involved in phosphatidyl and inositol pathways. So in particular, HER3, which is a modulator of the phosphatidyl inositol pathway, and PIP5, um, K1C, which is a phosphatidyl inositol kinase. And now, neither of these are directly linked to IP6 production, but it's quite possible um, that per perturbing them may impact the soluble inositol polyphosphate pools as well as the phosphatidyl inositol pathways. And the fact that these um, are, are linked, I think, will be a, a prime focus of our future studies. In terms of LCCS1, the um, the homozygous mutant, which results in this phenotype, is, has been mapped to an incorrect splicing due to uh, an incorrect splicing mutation that results in a three amino acid insertion in this domain of GLE1. Now, the, the C terminal domain of GLE1 is what's necessary and sufficient for activating the dead box protein and for binding IP6. This particular domain of GLE1, right here, um, you'll notice it says possible protein-protein interaction partners. So through all the two hybrid screens and protein interaction studies we've done over the years, we have not yet identified a protein interaction partner um, for this domain, although Andrew Folkman in the laboratory now has a prime candidate that we'll be following up on. What I'm going to talk to you about is the work of Lian Zhao, who is a postdoc fellow in the lab, who actually um, is doing his second postdoc with me. He did his first postdoc here at the NIH, so I'm the great benefactor of his great zebrafish training. And so what Lian has characterized is a set of zebrafish GLE1 mutants and zebrafish morpholino knockdowns in, um, of GLE1. And what he found with this particular mutant, which was from the Nancy Hopkins collection, is that these GLE1 mutants have LCCS1-like phenotypes. And so this is going to enable us to really map what is the primary physiological defect when you um, have defective GLE1 in a developing um, vertebrate system. And so they have a curved body, they are immodal. They have survived to this level of development due, we think, to the maternal pool of GLE1. If you do um, H&E stained plastic sections, this is the wild type and this is the spinal cord here. You can see in the GLE1 mutant there's a thinner spinal cord. There's also edema and an underdeveloped gut system, both all of which parallel the reported pathology of the human um, disease. And also, there is um, severe um, perturbations in craniocracial development. So this is um, staining of the cartilage in a, the head of a wild-type fish compared to this GLE1 knockout. Um, this is from a review showing you that, um, the normal, what the normal, um, normal looks like. But in this GLE1 knockout, um, the you know, neural cranium was mostly normal, but the pharyngeal cartilages were completely, um, nearly completely absent. And again, this correlates with um, the pathology in the human disease. Now, in terms of mapping and looking directly at the motor neurons, what Leanne has been able to do um, by selectively immunostaining different populations of neuron, motor neurons within these uh, mutant and morpholino knockdown zebrafish is um, find that the motor neuron pool is specifically depleted. If he compares here to sensory neurons, there's no statistical difference between wild type and mutant, but with the GLE1 knockdown, there's about 25% fewer um, motor neurons. And more so, because of the elegant uh, microscopy offered by the zebrafish system, he can look directly at the development of those motor neurons and at the arborization. 
And so um, looking at wild type here, you can see labeling of um, the motor neurons along in, in red bodies, and then along here you have the motor neurons and axons extending from the wild type in this very classic structure. But in the GLE-1 mutants, again, you see the fewer motor neurons along the top here in terms of the bodies, but then more so these axons have arborization defects in terms of the, um, the axons that are coming off of them. Now, our, one of the first experiments we've tried to do is to see whether or not we can complement this phenotype to be sure that it is a direct phenotype from the knockout of GLE-1, or if we're using the morpholinos from the knockdown of GLE-1. And in particular, um, we have done this by expressing the human form of GLE-1 in the zebrafish, and we get remarkable cross-species complementation and rescue with the wild type. And so this shows you with the Morpholino experiment um, how we uh, can get uh, a defect. And here, by expressing the wild type human form of GLE-1 in these fish that have the zebrafish GLE-1 knocked out, we get rescue of the phenotype. But if we express instead the fin major version, which is linked to the disease, we do not get rescue of the defect. And therefore, we think that this will be um, a primary and a very good system for testing the phenotypes of those disease mutants. Now, the newest work that um, Leanne has done is to really try to pinpoint within the developmental pathway of those motor neurons what is the primary defect. And so to do this, again, we can take advantage of the power of the zebrafish system and really differentially label different cell populations and monitor them um, throughout the time course of development. And so in this case, the question was trying to determine whether or not the fewer numbers of motor neurons um, that existed was due to those motor neurons dying, undergoing apoptosis, or was it due to neural progenitors dying or not being born to allow uh, the more mature cells to differentiate? So this is a cartoon diagram of essentially one half of this image. This is a slicing the fish um, down the, the middle so that you have a, a view of the um, the entire spinal um, area right here. And this is where the canal is along here. And so along this developmental pathway, the progenitors start out right along this line here, okay? And then as time progresses, they differentiate and migrate um, towards the outside edge. <clears throat> and as they differentiate, they um, become labeled by um, differentiation with this particular marker. And in this case, that's shown in red. So that's why the differentiated motor neurons are in red. And then along the um, middle, we have the, the radial glia or neural progenitors in green. And so if we look at this, this is just in a wild type situation. If we look at this in the mutant situation, it also coincidentally labeled the cells with caspase 3, which marks cells that are undergoing apoptosis, we can make the conclusion that it's the neural progenitors, um, not the newly born neurons, that are selectively dying with the loss of GLE-1. And so again, here's in purple are these caspase 3 apoptotic cells, and they are only co-labeled with green, which is reflecting the neural progenitors. We never see co-labeling between a caspase um, and between the red or the um, already committed, developed um, motor neurons. So in terms of speculating on the molecular defect in this human GLE-1 fin mutation, at this point, based upon the results we have in zebrafish, I would cross out a specific defect in any of these particular steps. And if you heard my talk, you know, two months ago or so at a Gordon conference, I would have probably implicated translation or localization and that maybe GLE-1 was specifically affecting one of those functions. But what we actually think right now is that highly proliferating cells, for example, these neuroprogenitors, are specifically affected by the threshold level, potentially, of every single step along this pathway that GLE-1 is impacting. And therefore, that's how, why the phenotype is manifested in those particular highly proliferating cells. <clears throat> 
And so that also could show that potentially factors which are <clears throat> multifunctionally linking multiple steps along this gene expression pathway might be more susceptible targets in these types of genetically inherited diseases because they would be highly required by highly proliferating cell types. And so the, the types of factors which we've been able to link together include the dead box proteins, GLE-1, and also the requirement of these inositol polyphosphates. And so if I take you through this whole time course, I really think that these are unexpected discoveries because I wouldn't have predicted um, going into a zebrafish model from studying mRNA export factors and tracking down um, the proliferation and growth activity of neuroprogenitors. But that's what really makes, I think, doing science um, so very exciting. I think the other aspect of this that I haven't told you about is that although in the particular case of GLE-1, we've linked it to a threshold effect in highly proliferating cells, we've gotten other potential disease links which are more direct and mechanistic from studying specifically the production of those soluble inositol polyphosphates, um, again using the zebrafish um, model. And although I don't have time to tell you about these, um, both, one was just published um, a couple months ago, and the other one was published over the last couple years. These are very intriguing examples where in this inositol polyphosphate pathway may be specifically um, affecting invertebrate cells um, more than just uh, uh, GLE-1. So I showed you in that original diagram that there were multiple functions that had been linked to them. Um, one that we've placed them to is in ciliary function. So if IP6 is not produced, cilia do not beat. And more so, if you don't produce one of these inositol pyrophosphates, um, hedgehog signaling is directly impacted. So in terms of future challenges for discovery researchers, I'd say that over the course of the years, I've discovered a lot of parts. Um, and, and all of the machine, much of the machinery um, that is involved in nucleocytoplasmic transport has been unraveled by people working in the field, and we can now reconstitute steps in vitro and directly analyze them in vivo. <clears throat> but really, our challenge is now to be able to study them spatially, temporally, and as parts of larger complexes and really interconnected pathways, especially when they're multifunctional. So I am especially in debt to the people in my laboratory. Over all the years, this is my current group. And those who are in red are um, the people currently in the lab where I discussed their unpublished work today. Those here have recently left the lab for um, bigger and better positions, but made critical contributions. And um, Bruce Apple has been a really uh, uh, important collaborator in all of our zebrafish work over the years, and recently collaborating with Chuck Cole in terms un of unraveling the DBP5 GLE1 cycle at the nuclear pore complex. And of course, my funding, um, I've been continuously funded by GM um, since the beginning of my laboratory, and I'm very grateful for that. And we have new funding from the March of Dimes and the American Heart Association for some of our zebrafish work. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So you have these uh, IP6 GLE1 interacting with different dead box proteins. Do you have any sense of how they're structurally interacting with the different proteins and whether that can give you any sort of insight as to why you have one that's activated and one that's inhibited? Right. So the dead box, or the DBP5 structures have been out for, since 2009. Those were published. Um, Karsten Weiss just published, like two weeks ago, a structure of the C-terminal region of GLE-1 with DBP5. Um, and that the C-terminal region of GLE-1 looks like um, EIF4G, and therefore there's you know, potential analogies between how different effectors could be um, affecting different dead box proteins. But it's really early days in terms of analyzing that structure. It's also of note that the structure that's published is not of wild-type proteins, and this is a really creative trick that they used because the wild-type proteins um, will not crystallize together, and so they used two dominant alleles um, that have a tighter affinity interaction with one another to get that crystal. <clears throat> 
And so um, in terms of dead one, there is no crystal structure of that. And so, um, and if you try to look for homology uh, to identify what could be the interaction interface, we have direct interaction between GLE1 and, and dead one in terms of recombinant protein interactions and coamino precipitations. But I think it's going to um, take one structural analysis and two, you know, we're starting work in terms of the ADP release, ATP loading, and those type of analogies to see if there's common commonalities in terms of that. IP6 is an obligatory partner of GLE1, but the phenotypes of the IP6 zebrafish doesn't, didn't seem to be the same as the GLE1 mutant. Can you comment on that? So um, the IP6 phenotypes are, um, okay, so first, if you knock down IP6 in zebrafish, you also get defects in motor neuron um, arborization and motor neuron development. I didn't show that. Um, but you do not get defects if, in cranial facial development if you knock down IP6. Um, so there, and we haven't assayed cilia function yet in GLE1 knockdowns, but GLE, IP6 is going to have many, many, many different targets in the cell. And so when you knock down IP6, you're basically impacting all the different targets that it has, which includes, at least that we know of, ADAR, the RNA editing enzyme, um, GLE1, you know, potentially. Um, some uh, you know, signaling receptors on the plasma membrane. So that's why their phenotypes in vertebrates are not going to be completely overlapping. And yeast cells, it might be a little bit simpler um, in terms of the, tar the number of targets. So Michael. I've always found inositol phosphate metabolism and its signaling properties completely perplexing, <laughs> even in a simple organism like yeast. But I'm wondering if you could at least speculate wildly as to why IP6 is being used for this critical role of, yeah. of docking the right. Um, the and so, I mean, the perplexing part that you don't bring up is that its subcellular levels are very high, in terms of you know um, very high concentrations. Although, what is the f free pool versus what's the protein bound pool? Especially based upon the ADAR work, ADAR does not fold without IP6, and IP6 is literally embedded within that structure. For GLE1, GLE1 folds without IP6. We can compete IP6 off. We can, it's a very different um, type of interaction than it is with ADAR. And um, John York has presented some really exciting results at recent meetings in terms of identifying a whole new family of IP6 binding proteins. Again, which might be more like ADAR in terms of the fact that it's buried within it. So I would wildly speculate that there are potentially targets which are modulated and potentially targets which are using it more as a, a folding cofactor. And there are, there are those two different types. And now it's going to be very difficult to tease apart which is which. Um, now, the, the GLE1 dead one, even though it doesn't require IP6 and IP6 has no effect, GLE, IP6 can still bind to it. And so you, uh, dead one doesn't prohibit the binding of IP6 to GLE1. Um, so my, my speculation is that there's going to be two different types of, of pools of IP6. Are there any specific interactions between GLE1 and the nucleoporins? Uh, yes. So there are two different documented GLE1 um, nuclear porin interactions. One is with a cytoplasmic face NUP, which is called HCG1 in human cells and NUP42 or RIP1 in yeast cells, and that's on the cytoplasmic face. And the other is only been documented with human GLE1. We have found an interaction with um, a NUP called NUP155, which is actually linked in a human disease of atrial fibrillation, um, uh, patients with particular atrial fibrillation problems. And so that's very interesting um, whether or not the, work, the groups that have been working on that have been um, potentially implicating uh, mRNA export and GLE1 to that, too. So as a follow-up question to that, do you envision the role of GLE1 in translation as somehow being part of an HNRP or you know, loading on to this RNP when it's leaving the nucleopore or interacting with ribosomes which are only near right. the envelope? Right. I do not think it gets incorporated into that mRNP as it's being exported, but rather that it's recruited to different scaffolds, either in export or um, translation initiation or translation termination that juxtaposition it next to the dead box protein that it's going to activate. 
One reason why I don't think it's incorporated into those MRNPs is based upon the cellular copy number and levels. So uh, it's a, you know, DBP5 is 20,000 copies estimated in a yeast cell versus GLE one's 2,000. So there's not one GLE one for every DBP5. There's also not one GLE one for every messenger RNA or um, translation initiation or termination of it. So it has to be very rapidly turning over and cycling um, be between these different functions. So I wanted to ask you a question about the, the role of the NUP-159 so it, in uh, releasing the ADP. So uh, since GLE-1 and DBP-5 are also working at termination, so what do you think is doing the ADP release at, ter at terminate? I assume NUP-159 mutants don't have a termination phenotype. Right. Yeah, NUP-159 mutants do not have any translation initiation or termination defects. It's actually been used as kind of like the gold standard control by both um, my laboratory and other laboratories for GLE-1 and DBP-5 in terms of a NUP that doesn't have those defects. Um, we speculate that there is another factor that can mediate ADP release um, during translation termination and potentially that that's um, helping recycle DBP-5 when NUP-159 um, when that binding region for NUP159 is absent, cells are not dead, but they're temperature sensitive. And you can suppress that temperature sensitivity by overexpressing DBP5, and potentially it's a translation termination uh, triggering release factor. That could, could, could potentially be um, a part of the ribosome. It could potentially be um, SUP45 or SUP35. Um, it, I mean, those are the candidates that we're going to begin um, testing directly in vitro, um, but then in vivo we're going to try to use that NUP159 mutant that lacks the DBP5, DBP5 um, that doesn't bind DBP5 to look for um, mutants which are now dead without that, that putative translation ADP release factor. Okay, I want to thank Susan again for the great Thank time. you.